Genesis 39, and we'll see it again tonight in Genesis 40, and you can imagine what we're going to see in Genesis 41, and 42, and 43. It never stops. All the way to the end of Joseph's life in Genesis chapter 50. So let's examine these tonight, beginning in verse 1, and we don't have to go far. You're going to begin seeing these, I hope you already have, as they begin to pop at you like popcorn and you see them for yourselves. Verse 1, And it came to pass after these things that the butler of the king of Egypt and his baker offended the Lord, their king. So there's two prisoners with Joseph. Now Joseph is already in prison, remember? Because of Potiphar's wife making a false accusation against him and he was thrown into the ward and now he's going to have two more men join him in that ward. And that takes us to the cross where it says there were two prisoners with Jesus Christ. Matthew chapter 27, verse 38. You know this, right? There was one thief on his right and one thief on his left. And we're going to see more about these guys as we go through the chapter, but that's the first two things we notice that these two. Now, one other thing, this really doesn't relate to Christ, but I don't know when I'm going to be back to Genesis chapter 40, so therefore it, it should be taken note that the number 40, chapter 40, the number 40 is the time of probation and testing in the Bible. 40 years in the wilderness, 40 days of fasting for Jesus Christ and Moses and Elijah. So you come across the number 40 in the Bible, you just be heads up and go, okay, there, there may be something here that I can see that will help me a little more. So just take note of that number, the number 40 in that chapter, we're in 40, and Joseph is really being tested in this chapter. Verse 2, and Pharaoh was wroth against the two of his officers, against the chief of the butlers, and against the chief of the bakers. So, the king's wrath is poured out against the lawbreakers. Now, what they did specifically, we don't know, but it doesn't matter. It's just that the king's wrath has been poured out against these two for something they did wrong. Does that ring a bell? Have you ever done wrong? For all of sin to come short of the glory of God. And what happens when you do wrong? Romans chapter 1 verse 28 says the wrath of God is poured out upon you. And it gives you a whole list of sins that God hates in Romans 1 28. It's just a whole list of them. And all of us are guilty of something. You may not be guilty of what I'm guilty of, and I may not be guilty of what you're guilty of. I may do three times as many things as you do, but it doesn't matter. All have sinned and come short of the glory of God. It doesn't matter if you've sinned a thousand times or a hundred million times. You're going to have to answer for one sin. Now, basically what it all comes down to is you're going to have to answer for the sin of rejecting Jesus Christ. That's the sin. All other sins are just, okay, I'm not saying there are some good sins and some bad sins. There are some worse sins than there are other sins, but no sin is good. That's like saying, well, I got cancer, but it ain't as bad as you got cancer. Well, you got cancer, right? So you're a sinner. And so because of that, God pours out his wrath upon the sinner. But Jesus Christ, you know the gospel, took our place and took on the wrath of God. That cup he drank was filled with the wrath of God and he took the place. So he actually went to prison for us. So Joseph is in prison, type of Christ. And he's there with these two with him. And everybody is in prison. We're waiting, we're waiting for a prison break. We are in a sense right now, even though we're saved, we are in a prison. And my mom last week got her prison break. As long as we're in this tabernacle, then we are caught in here and we can't get out. And it's not lawful for us to escape on our own. Some people do that by committing suicide, but that's unlawful. That's, that's self-murder. It's homicide, but you're the perpetrator and the victim. So that's not lawful. So the Apostle Paul says in Romans chapter 7, 
Who shall deliver me from the body of this death? And what's he talking about in that whole chapter? The whole chapter he's talking about, well, the things I would do, I do not. And the things I would not do, that do I. And so that there's a battle between the flesh and the spirit always going on. Are you familiar with that? Yeah, always going on because your spirit wants to do one thing. Your body wants to do your flesh, wants to do another thing. And the only way to get out is to get released from this prison. And our prison break is coming someday. Hopefully it will be at the rapture of the church, 1 Thessalonians chapter 4 and 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Now the next thing, verse 3, it says, and they put them in ward. That's why they're called wardens, by the way. It comes right out of your Bible. You go up to, the, to, to a number, num, number of prison guards or maybe even wardens and say, Do you even, why are you called a warden? They probably don't know the answer, but you do. That's what the Bible calls them. So, they're the warden. They're putting the ward in the house of the captain of the guard into the prison, the place where Joseph was bound. So he's bound. John 18, 12 verse says he was bound. You just can't. It just happens over and over and over again. You say, well, you're stretching a little bit. No, I'm not stretching. I'm probably not seeing all that's there. You can't look at Joseph and say, well, he was bound and Jesus was bound and in the context see all these other things going around and you say, man, God, see, Jesus Christ died. How long from this? Well, this is 1,800 years before Christ ever showed up. And Christ, it wasn't until he was 30 years old that that happened. So this is 17 or 1800 years before Christ and everything that happens in these things, I've already shown you how many, 30, 35, 40, 45, I've already shown you that many. And it keeps going and going and going. It shows you that God knew what was going to happen before it happened and put it on the life of Joseph. So you would read it and we would read it and go, well, that's no coincidence. What's the odds of that happening. And I'll tell you what, the odds of that happening by chance are impossible. Impossible. Couldn't happen. So God, as he says, I'm the Alpha and the Omega. I'm the beginning and the ending. I know what's going to happen before it happens, and I can tell you what's going to happen before it happens. 600 years before Christ, it says, Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes ye were healed. That's 600 years before Christ. What happened? Just that, exactly as it says, and more. Then verse 4 it says, And the captain of the guard charged Joseph with them, and he served them, and they continue to seize. And that wording is so fascinating. So these two guys are put in prison with Joseph and Joseph is charged with them. What does that mean? If somebody's put in charge, what does that mean? They're the boss, right? They're the supervisor. They're the one over the other. There's some authority in this prison and the guard says, you watch out for them. But what did he do even though he was in charge? He served them. John chapter 13, verse 1 to 12, what did Jesus do? He donned a towel and he came up and he washed the disciples' feet and he said, I didn't come to be served. Who is he? He's the Lord of glory. He is Without him was not anything made that was made. By him all things consist. If Jesus Christ walked in this room in the flesh right now, you know what we'd do? We'd get on our face and we'd bow down to him. And what did he do? He got down and bowed down to those dirty fishermen and washed their feet. <laughs> and so he serves as an example of every kind. If you want to be a leader, that's the kind of leader you want to be. And there's a whole there's a whole passel of library full of servant leadership and that philosophy of how to lead. You lead by serving. And that's what Jesus Christ did. Peter said, nope, you're going to wash my feet. And so, Lord, uh, as we saw Sunday about Peter, Peter's just so impulsive. He said, well, if you're going to wash my feet, just wash my whole body. <laughs> 
And the Lord said, no, Peter, that isn't necessary. I'm just going to wash your feet, okay? That's as personal as we're getting today. Verse 5, it says, And they dreamed a dream, and both of them, that's the butler and the baker, each man his dream in one night, and each man, according to the interpretation of his dream, the butler and the baker of the king of Egypt, which were bound in the prison. So Jesus Christ was numbered with the transgressors. Mark chapter 15, verse 28. When they counted and said, how many thieves are on the cross? They went, that day Jesus Christ died, they went one, two, three. How many transgressors on the cross? Three numbered with the transgressors. Now, if you and I had been in that situation or like Joseph's situation, uh, every, you know, we'll justify ourselves in our own eyes according to the book of uh, Job, I think it is. We'll justify ourselves in our own eyes so we're always ready to defend ourselves. It's just part of our nature. That doesn't make you odd. That makes you normal. And so if we've been in this situation, he'd say, oh, no, no, he's guilty and he's guilty, but I'm innocent. I didn't do anything wrong. And Jesus could have. He could, yeah, they're, they're thieves, but I'm not. But he became sin for us who knew no sin, that we might be, uh, that we might be saved, that we might have his righteousness through him. So he was numbered with the transgressors. There was no difference between Joseph and the butler and the baker. They're all prisoners and they're all bound. Verse 6, And Joseph came in unto them in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. Now this sadness, he asked him in the next verse, Why are you sad? Why are you sad? No, he, they look upon, Joseph, Joseph came in the morning and looked upon them, and behold, they were sad. And they, he asked him in the next verse, look at the end of the verse, Wherefore look ye so sadly today, now, if you've read Luke 24 lately, you recognize that question. There were two disciples on the road to Emmaus. Remember that story? And they're leaving Jerusalem. And it's been three days since all these events took place, they say. And the Lord Jesus Christ, they don't know who he is. Their eyes are beholden. So they can't, he, God's hid their eyes. It's like hide and seek. He's hid their eyes so they can't know who he is. You ever wonder if the Lord does that with you? You might come across someone, say at the, if, this makes life exciting. You come across someone at the gas station and he withholds your eyes and you just think, ah, it's And the Lord prompts your heart to help them. And you go, ah, I better not do that. This is a dangerous world. I don't know what I ought to do. Well, if the Lord prompts you to do something, I'd do it. Because some have entertained angels unawares. I'm just saying, don't be dumb, you know. Get your, get your, you know, your hot sauce in your pocket there and, Get my dollar with this one and say, okay. <laughs> you know, just be smart. Don't be dumb. But why are they sad? Same question, Luke 24, 17. Why are you so sad today? And they go, man, where have you been? Have you not heard what happened? And I love this I love this question from the Lord. Have you not heard of the things that have been going on the last few days? And he asked a two-word question. What things? <laughs> See, that shows you a side of God's personality. That he's like a... I think we miss this about God. He's, sort of, he's humorous. He likes to play with you sometimes, just to poke you. What, what things are you talking about? So anyway, are you sad? Then, verse 7, he interprets the dream. And he asks... Pharaoh's officers that were with him in word of in word of the Lord's house, saying, Wherefore look ye so sad today? And they said unto him, We have dreamed a dream, and there is no interpreter of it. And Joseph said unto them, Do not interpretations belong to God? Tell me, I pray you. Now that's a great act of faith. 
no type of Christ there. Well, there is. There is. But the fact that he says, tell me, God interprets them, tell me. Are you God? Well, no, but I know what, I know what God says. You tell me what it is, and God will tell me what to say. So interpretations, infallible interpretations, belong to God. So the same thing, the same story in Luke 24, 17, where he asked them, why are you sad? Joseph asked for sad. God gives Joseph an interpretation, and in Luke 24, 45, it says the Lord took the Bible and showed them throughout the law of Moses himself. And I wouldn't be surprised, would you, if he didn't go to Genesis and say, look at Joseph. You see everything that happened to Joseph? That happened to me. You know who Joseph was? He was a picture of me. You see Joseph, you saw me. You saw Moses, you saw me. You saw Rahab, you saw me. You saw Boaz and Ruth, you saw me. And went through all the scriptures with that. Interpretations belong to God. Then uh, let's get to verse 9. And the chief butler told his dream to Joseph and said unto him, In my dream, behold, a vine was, was before me. And in the vine there were three branches, and it was as though it budded and her blossoms shot forth, and the clusters thereof brought forth ripe grapes. And Pharaoh's cup was in my hand, and I took the grapes and pressed them into Pharaoh's cup. And I gave the cup to Pharaoh's hand. And Joseph said unto him, this is the interpretation of it, the three branches for three days, and within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head and restore thee into thy place. And thou shalt deliver Pharaoh's cup into his hand after the former manner when thou wast with the butler. But think on me when it shall be well with thee, and show kindness, I pray thee, unto me. And make mention of me unto Pharaoh and bring me out of this house. I'm going to keep going. I'll come back to that. For indeed I was stolen away out of the land of Hebrews, and here I have done nothing and they should put, that they should put me in this dungeon. And when the chief baker saw that the interpretation was good, he said to Joseph, I also was in my dream, and behold, I had three white baskets on my head, and the uppermost basket was of all manner of baked meats for Pharaoh. And the birds did eat them out of the basket upon my head. And Joseph answered and said to him, This is the interpretation there of the three baskets of three days, and within three days shall Pharaoh lift up thine head from thee, and shall hang thee on a tree, and the birds shall eat the flesh of thee. Now don't you hate to be that guy. I mean, the first guy gets an interpretation of, You're getting out of here in three days, and the next guy, I'd say he probably, after that interpretation, wandered over and sort of sat in the corner and sulked and said, Well, that's just your interpretation. Well, you find out that it happens. Now let's back up a little bit. What's here? Both elements of the Lord's Supper. Grapes. You know why Baptists use grapes? There are several places in the Bible I can show you. But here's the first one. Grapes. Now I know wine comes from grapes. But new wine is found in the cluster. And Jesus Christ said, I will not drink it new till I drink it I will not drink it till I drink it new with you in the kingdom. New wine is found in the cluster. So we drink, we drink grape juice, let the others use wine. Elements of the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And then both of them have the interpretation that this is going to happen in three days. In three days, the butler will be restored. In three days, the baker will be hung. Three days, Jesus Christ said in Matthew chapter 12, verse 40, as Jonas was three days and three nights in the heart of the earth, so shall the Son of Man be three days and three nights in the heart of the earth. Then the resurrection comes. Next, verse 15, the thing we read that Jesus Christ, Joseph is called a Hebrew. I'm an Hebrew. I'm a Jew. Jesus Christ was a Hebrew. He identified with Seth's race, not Japheth. Ham had three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. Jesus Christ did not come from Japheth. He was not a white man, all this white supremacy stuff. He was not a white man, and he was not a black man. He did not come from Ham. Who did he come from? He came from Shem. Shem. Did Shem have an advantage? Oh, yes, Shem had an advantage. Did Shem have an advantage over the Hebrew, over the Japheth, over the European, and over the African? 
Absolutely he did. Oh, preacher, you're making me nervous. I bet I am. But I'm giving you Bible. You know what it says in Romans? Let me show you what it says. Let me show you what it says. You know why people hate the Jews? And they've hated them forever. They've hated them forever. They still hate them. You know why? I'm going to show you why. Romans chapter 3. Look at the question. I'm not going to answer the question. Here's the question. What advantage hath the Jew? What profit is there in circumcision? Do the Jews have an advantage? What's the next verse say? Much. Every way. Much every way. Why? Because given unto them were the oracles of God. Every writer of that book is a Jew. No fail. Who had the Bible in the Old Testament? The Jews. Who did Jesus Christ come to? The Jews. He even said in Matthew chapter 10, I'm not come to the Gentiles. Now the door opened up for the Gentiles, thank God, because the Jews rejected them. But that was not the original plan. The original plan was he was a Jew who came into his own and his own received him not. So I would just, you know, I'm not going to argue anybody about that stuff. It's just bait, right, uh, race baiting. It's just all that stuff. It just makes me sick to hear about because all I want to do when they start all that stuff about white supremacy and all that stuff, I just want to say, you know who the supreme one is? It's the Shemite. You are saved by a Jew. That's why they hate him. That's why they hate him. They hate him because of Jesus Christ. They don't even know why they hate him. They don't know why. Hitler didn't have any idea why he was killing them. He just hated them. Pharaoh hated them and wanted to kill them. Nebuchadnezzar hated them and wanted to destroy them. It's been that way through history. What did Herod do? Kill all the two-year-olds. Why? He was at Jesus Christ. So he was a Hebrew. Nothing to shame about being a Hebrew. And if you ever meet a Jew, you shake their hand and say, it's a privilege to meet you. You're a son of Abraham and I admire you. Because I know that book says in Genesis chapter 12, I will bless him that blesseth thee and I will curse him that curseth thee. And you know what side of the ledger I want to be on? I want to be on the blessing side. So what do I do? I pray for the peace of Jerusalem like the Bible commands me to. And I pray for those Jews. I love the Jews. I love them. Now, are they an ornery bunch? The most ornery bunch you'll ever come across. Ever come across. Why? They're Jacob. What does that mean? They're deceivers. Hebrews, Matthew chapter 1. Now, let's go back here. Verse 16. One of these guys goes free and one of them dies. What happened on the cross? One went free and one died and went to hell. One went to paradise and one went to hell. And how did the one who died die? He was hung on a tree. No accident. He was hung on a tree. That foreshadows and tells you and prophesies the type of death that Jesus Christ would die. He would hang on a tree. So it can't be a coincidence, right? Two guys, Lord's Supper, one gets away, one doesn't, and the one that doesn't get away dies on the cross. And that's the end of Genesis chapter 40. And chapter 41, more to come.